Hi, my name is Bob McGuire. I'm N4HY. I live in near Auburn University in Alabama. I'm uh, recently retired as the chief scientist for the Hume Center at Virginia Tech, which is currently the largest funded research center at Virginia Tech, where I did sulfur defined radio and lots of other things, including machine learning applied to problems for which we received contracts and grants uh, and educated lots of students. So I learned about uh, machine learning and applying it to a radio problem, which I will discuss later, but it led me to think that this kind of activity might be useful for ham radio. So I'm gonna pursue it. I'm gonna tell you how I'm gonna do it. Let's start right at the beginning. What is machine learning? I'm sure lots of you have heard of deep learning and machine learning and all sorts of things. What is, what is any of this? And what, is it, what will it mean to us? So let, let's just start from the beginning. So this is a quote from the CEO of NVIDIA, machine learning at its most basic is the practice of using algorithms or computer programs to, to data, learn from it, and then making a determination or prediction about something in the world, something in the environment predicted by what the data is telling us. That's a little, that's a little tough to kind of get through, but this one from Andrew Ng is a famous machine learning person at Stanford University. Machine learning is the science of getting computers to act without being explicitly programmed. That's pretty good. That's, that's a little better, a little more easy to understand. Machine learning is based on algorithms that can learn from data without relying on rules-based programming. So now we're getting down to it. We don't want the computer to have to write down a, 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 a rules to make decisions or classifications or determinations uh, with a human involved at all. So that's the goal, but we're, are we there? Let's see. So machine learning algorithms can figure out how to perform important tasks by generalizing from examples. That's also a form of machine learning and how to generalize a trained algorithm is a part of, the, part of the issues that all of us uh, need to face when dealing with a computer trying to apply learning. Machine learning is the ability of the machine to learn on its own. Now that's the most general of these and it's of course a very lofty goal. And so major steps have been made. I mean, uh, you see this every single day, you're on say your cell phone or on your computer and you ask Google or, or uh, 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 in another search engine uh, or talk to your phone or ask for directions from your GPS module and all those things, machine learning is there to interpret what you ask and turn after it's classified and determine what you've asked, it then executes an action. And that is also machine learning. Let's, so let's just keep going and see where we can get uh, with these kind of really high level, uh, high level descriptions of machine learning. Well, for now, machine learning is exactly like this. You got a couple of machines and a person is trying to orchestrate what they're doing. Now, it's less like sitting down and writing a program, but a human is still involved. And for right now, that is, that is just the nature of the beast. And so we're teaching these computers how to learn from data, mostly using heuristics. Now these heuristics have an extremely firm foundation, but as with all these extremely firm foundations, there's, there's caveats that one has to, needs to understand so you don't make a mistake or misapply what you get. So there's the universal approximation theorem, which was a really major finding uh, that a lot of people didn't believe. So let's have a bunch of data as inputs to a black box. 
And the universal approximation theorem says that if you've got a bunch of neural nets doing something inside this black box, that you can do with a finite number of neural nets, get as close to the actual realistic output given that data as you want by increasing the complexity of the neural nets inside. So you can get there. You can actually train neural nets, take in input data to get as close as you want to the actual real function you want on operating on that data. Now that is a big deal. It doesn't tell you how to do it. It just says you can do it. So this is one of the major kinds of problems or issues with these kinds of theorems. It's an existence theorem without how to do the construction. It's not a construction process, it's an existence theorem. So one of the major techniques that is used for trying to get a universal approximation based uh, uh, situation, machine, algorithm, et cetera, to learn something from the data is done by stochastic gradient descent. And we're gonna go through how that's done without go, go to high, at a high level, without actually getting down to the nitty gritty details. But just let me tell you until the 2000s, uh, really 2008 or the, thereabouts, the stochastic gradient descent was known, but it just was completely impractical. And then Hinton, Jeffrey Hinton, a well-known computer scientist, took a set of handwritten letters and alphabet, and mostly numbers in the beginning, and trained a computer to recognize these handwritten numerals on automatic pilot without a person telling them what to do. So he figured out how to train it. And it was a stochastic gradient descent algorithm and he called it back propagation. So there, there is a way to tell the computer given input data and it make a guess, how well did it do? So it's in critical importance that from the beginning, when you're applying machine learning, you have a way to tell the computer how well did it do. So again, those two things, stochastic gradient descent and universal approximation theorem, there's a hidden secret. We pretend they apply perfectly. And therefore, we're talking about heuristics. Uh, there are some theorems, but again, in general, we don't actually know for certain when we start this process of machine learning training, it will actually work. So what do machine learning techniques do? So of all these weird things on the left, how do we get to a place where they are ready trained and ready to work? Well, first we have to have data. We have to have input data of the type we want to present at random whenever we want to, we have to have data from that class so that we can train the machine how to recognize it's from that class and do something useful with it. So lots and lots of data. And right now data is an extremely important and expensive part. From that data, we want to derive a model. And a model is a machine learning algorithm that we're going to construct by doing uh, iterative analysis on the data. So how does the iterative analysis work? So we take data, we feed it into our model, we get an output, and then we have an objective function. The objective function measures how close your predicted output is to the actual one you desire. And we will go over some examples to make this clear. And the this process of data model objective function and feedback is the optimization algorithm. And the optimization algorithm as we feed this, uh, the error back through is a, an instance of a stochastic gradient descent algorithm. So what are the machine learning types? We'll go over these uh, and I don't expect you to remember them but I'm just going over them for completeness. And they, they, are, they are illustrative of kind of things we have to think about. Unsupervised learning is where you don't know anything about the data. You don't know what the, how to label it. 
And so you take these, they take these uh, pieces of data and you feed them into algorithms and the algorithms that you feed them to discover structure, discover, discover meaningful ways to compress that data into classes. And from this, you, you find features in the data as presented to this machine learning algorithm, which allows you to uh, put the data into different boxes. And so this unsupervised learning was how everything was done until we got very, very good at doing a different kind of learning. Supervised learning is where you still have lots and lots of data, but, but you feed the data to your machine and you know what the output should be while you're training. And you're going through looking at the output of the machine and saying, look, you're an error. And here, here's the error. And here's how bad the error is. And based on that input, it corrects itself. It, it learns how to do better slowly over time with lots and lots of data. Semi-supervised, that's where like website classification and uh, speech analysis, face recognition, customer segmentation, where the like kind of things you see on Google or your phone when it's recognizing your voice or you enter a search term and it's doing the best it can. So this is semi-supervised in that you some supervised learning goes in and then it generalizes from there. And the generalization is not done with a little much supervision. That's, a, that's an example. Reinforcement learning is really, really neat. You, you take your problem and you have some input data, which in this case, the data is describing the current environment and the state of your state of your system. And you let the machine learning based model take the data and the current status and compute an action. And the, then the action is taken by the system and you get feedback on whether or not the action was good and appropriate, whether you got the reward, you, you've got your, your, your dog got its food from clicking on the lever or it didn't. And then you, it goes on and learns from that without human intervention. And we've seen some spectacular examples, which I will go over later. And then anomaly detection, such as credit card fraud or a cyber intrusion is a major uh, uh, growing area. Uh, area in machine learning and it's badly needed because we've all seen all the headlines about all the fraud and cyber intrusions lately. We, we really need machines to be able to help us do this since we don't have enough manpower to do it even if we knew how. So unsupervised learning is, 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 is demonstrated by these pictures uh, on the right. So a kid playing with toys and doing things with it, uh, that's unsupervised learning. And the robot is taking a bunch of stuff and trying to figure out how to classify them or name them or cluster them into the different groups. This is typical of unsupervised learning and it is really how kids learn uh, a lot it's, it, it, for, for the most part. So it isn't completely random. Of course it's not. The robot can't classify things in a vacuum and a kid can't learn from things that aren't there. So in both these cases, data and or things, objects, words, pictures, whatever, are placed in front of the child or the robot or the computer, and you are influencing the things it has available to it to learn from. So you bias and or guide the learning by what you expose the learning system to. Then the child computer robot learns to separate things into classes or groups. So you, you for example, down on the floor in front of the child are, are dinosaurs and a tiger. And maybe after a little bit of uh, playing, the kid can tell the difference between a dinosaur, an alligator, and a tiger. They're different. So unsupervised learning can be a goal in itself, discovering hidden patterns in data that you didn't know that were there in the beginning, or you would have done it already, or it's a means towards an end in learning a feature. So if you have a feature uh, that you did not know was in the data and your machine helped you learn the feature, then you can use that feature in how to use the data. 
And the reinforcement learning algorithm, it's where you have an, 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 an agent, which is your computer, and it has a policy that says, if I see the environment and I know where my, where, what state my system is in, based on this policy, I will tell the system to take an action. So given a state and a policy and a reading on the environment, the agent says, take this action. And if you, the action is good, do you, do you evaluate the policy by giving yourself a reward? And so if you start losing out on rewards, that means you need to update your policy. But since you've evaluated your policy as not being correct, you want to modify the policy. So that's one version of this. And so this goes around in a loop and a loop until eventually you begin getting more and more and more reward for the, action, for the modifications you've made to your machine learning model. And we have spectacular examples. One of the first spectacular ones where basically nothing was told to the machine and then it had these screens while it was playing Atari uh, and the, the Atari, Go, Atari machines. And it learned how to win these games better than any human that ever played them by, by trial and error and getting a feedback on how well it did and a reward for doing better. And then the one I thought basically would not happen before I died, but did anyway, there's so much for my intuition, was uh, the Go game, which is by many people's uh, opinion and some difficulty uh, classification based on some pretty, pretty difficult mathematics is Go is really difficult. And, but the computer, given the Go stones, uh, playing against uh, humans and again, then later against itself, can learn how to win Go better than any human that ever played the game. And that was really surprising. Uh, and it, it didn't take that long. It was, it was a, a, a few days from scratch after they learned the right algorithm for updating the game. And so these are spectacular things. Okay, so what do we want to do? Well, last but le not least, since it's kind of where we're going here, is supervised learning. So let's start in the center where you've got the teacher telling the two robots, uh, giving them a lesson. That's kind of how you want to think about it. So again, an example in the upper left is the teacher showing the robot pictures. And when it gets it right, it's told yes. And when it gets wrong, it's told no. And it does this over and over and over again. And there's this algorithm that updates the robot's knowledge based on what it sees, and it gets better and better over time at getting the right answer. So, supervise, so let's look in the upper right. So once the model has converged and is doing the right thing, uh, the, by, by you first giving it input and telling it these are apples, then you do, are bananas or whatever. So it eventually, gets a very high probability of getting the right prediction about what it's being shown. So that's the goal, is over time being shown lots of examples where it guesses the answer and you, then you tell it what the real answer is and it grades itself based on a, a, on a, a objective function, how well it did and it learns how to do better from repeating this over and over. This is repetition learning at its best. So kind of a more uh, algorithmic presentation is you've got training data you feed into your algorithm and it, the machine learning model issues a guess and then it's graded on the guess. So this is now, this picture is of a trained model. So now you're, you've got a model where it's been trained and you give it unseen and unlabeled data and it picks the right answer. That's a good thing your machine model is trained. And this is us as hams for now. I think this is really what we, we can do. And this is what we should do on some really interesting problems. So let's go from there. So look, this is uh, www.sigidwiki.com. And it has some really interesting things on it, which I think are very useful. Uh, it has frequency bands and in these frequency bands, it has identified signals and unidentified signals. And to the extent possible, they have been further classified into these classes, military, radar, et cetera, down through time. 
So all of us know time signals that are on the air and we've all heard number stations and we've also heard interference and we know we've also seen noise, which is rare and inactive. Uh, and so, uh, so this is the kinds of things that would allow us to have data which we can use to train our models. So my initial goal is to take, take things that are in HF and VHF and using the kind of categories that are in here and some, some instances of the uh, data that's actually in the database for this website and do some initial training and then uh, figure out where to go from there with the uh, machine learning models. But, but I wanna use this data in here uh, in the beginning because it's there's 424 classified and identified signals uh, and lots of quite a few about half of them are unidentified which is which is interesting the thing I fear is the unidentified signals will have very few uh, pieces of data in which to learn from but that's part of part of part of the project anyway so friends can help so I have these two friends that have data Jeffrey Moss, aka ND, is a big time contester, and uh, both in contests and not in contests, Jeffrey has recorded many, many hours of HF data, and uh, from the, he has eight terabytes of data just from HF contests, and that's a good case where you've got lots and lots and lots of uh, uh, instances of signals, and they need to be marked and told what the signal is so that that data can, with the signal recorded and the data marked, that can be used as training data for learning one of these machine learn models in a supervised learning program. And now you're getting an idea of where I want to go. So Phil Karn, KA9Q, well-known radio amateur, uh, member of AMSAT Tapper, uh, president of ARDC, uh, has, has gotten enamored of taking software-defined radio and running it on low-end equipment, and he's done the following. He has four terabytes and growing of data listening to the VHF and UHF FM bands, running on a Raspberry Pi, talking to a to homebrew software-defined radio with the radio interface, uh, an air spy with uh, uh, listening to the VHF and UHF in bands. So he has a filter bank, not polyphase, that's, that's wrong. It's a filter bank, but it's not polyphase. And he divides these, these bands into channels and listens to the signals with an algorithm that tells him whether or not the channel is in use. And so he records the channel if it's in use and he constantly runs 24 hours a day monitoring the FM bands. So now Phil has given me a device that has actual signals of interest. They are marked as to what they are and only the snippets that contain usable signal are, are recorded. And this is a good thing. So in addition to this, we need lots of stuff from, from uh, the, the bands that, that are marked as noise or interference or other things. So we can distinguish the FM signals of choice uh, from the actual noise that's in the band. Okay, so look, one of the things you got to have if you want to train one of these machine learning models is a, is a supercomputer. And so I've built one. And so this is with the side off and all the things dangling out to be able to easily take a picture of them. So in the upper right with all the colorful things, upper left where all the colorful things are, you see in the center this circular thing with TT on it, uh, that's for thermal talking. That is a water cool jacket sitting on top of an AMD thread, thread ripper processor, the 3970X, which has 32 cores and 64 threads. So uh, that's quite, quite a computer. Lots of cash so that things are easily moved in and out quickly, so long as you're running tight algorithms and over data that's arranged in blocks, it can do it easily and really get some speed up. So you see these vertical bars to the left and to the right of, of, of bars of light to the left and to the right of the 
of the water jacket for the processor. That's DDR memory. And that's 256 gigabytes of very fast memory. And above the memory and the processor with its water jacket, you see these colorful fans. And behind the colorful fans is a water reservoir. And below the thermal taki jacket, you see these pipes, they go up to the reservoir. So warmed water goes into the, 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 uh, the reservoir, which has ribbed fins on it. The fan cools the, the water that's inside the reservoir and feeds back cooler water to the processor and controls the temperature of the processor. So that's that just, just let me tell you up front, that is not cheap. Uh, it's just not. And so I uh, hope, but let me, so let me say from the outset, this is not something you need. And that's a good thing because you need, a, you need one or two people that have these kinds of things and are able and capable of using them to train the models. So in the, uh, below, below that picture, there are these two horizontal bars with a bow tie on the left. And you see the word GeoForce on them. It's covered up as GeoForce RTX. These are high-end GPUs, and these are GeoForce RTX 3090s, and there are two of them. So that's so between the processor, memory, cooler, and those two GPUs, and another little piece I'll tell you about. That's a that's a that's a fairly serious used car or or uh, uh, something like that. It's it's not cheap. So, but it but it's needed. And I'll tell you why. Look, tell you why later. So the thing I want to point out to you uh, is uh, this bow tie right here on the on the left side of these cards. So what that bow tie does is gang these two graphics processing cards together, so that under certain circumstances and under the right control, they can work together. And they, why do these graphics cards matter? The the mathematics that is needed to do the stochastic gradient descent algorithm to train these models is best done on GPU cards that have certain technical capabilities inside them. And I'm just gonna tell you what it is without going into any explanation. They have these tensor processing units in them, which, which is really, really helpful to doing machine learning. And to point out to you the supercomputer nature here is up here you can see that I've got a version of top telling me that I'm right now while it's sitting in idle using two and a half gigabytes of the 252 that is available uh, for, for the user. And you can see that there's two gigs of swap and basically I've got nothing running now. So you only see the little wiggles for things the machine is doing. Uh, and uh, you can, you can really tax this thing to the max where all the threads are, are running and the machine is really, really, really getting uh, uh, taxed to its limits. And these fans spin up really loud and the water flows really fast and it keeps the, the processor cool enough so that it can keep running even at full tilt. So these graphics processing cards down here and this these, this water cooling and this processor, they consume a lot of power. And down here you see the EVGA 1600 watt computer power supply. That's where almost all of these cables are going or feeding power to these things. So it's a 1600 watts uh, and I've run these GPUs flat out with the processor running flat out and it has a 1350 watt steady state. And it spikes a little bit above that, but 1,350 watts is kind of the steady state uh, limit for the things I'll be doing. And over here is just another view of the CPUs and what they're doing. So this is a true supercomputer. And for, for I, 10 years ago, I couldn't have dreamed of owning this. I would have had to go to work to get access to anything like it. And frankly, I didn't have uh, a computer that would do what this one would do. So you're getting into this age where computer complexity and computer capabilities are just really taking off and going through the roof. Uh, so it's just a really great thing and that we now have access to these things. And it's affordable for a person who is really serious and wants to do it at home. And, and I'm very 
feel very, very lucky to have the resources to be able to get, put this computer together at home and do the work that needed. So this is the computer, but you also need some software. So I'm just giving you an example of one here, which is very, very popular and is likely to be used in this work. And this is TensorFlow. And I've just shown you on the left side here, the, the opening web page when you go to TensorFlow. And it, up, it tells you how to install it, how to set other things up, gives you examples of how to do uh, computer training. And so I wanna go over one here in this picture that is illustrative of the kind of things we are doing. So th there's a basic classification. Notice that's a basic one, that's a training program. And literally what we're about to try to do and apply is technically equivalent to this basic learning algorithm. So I'm very high confidence that it will work. And I, there are other reasons I'm very confident. So we're gonna take, oops, sorry. We're gonna take a, a, a bunch of data and like it's done here. And you'll notice this down here, what these little tiles in this picture are that you can barely see are instances of clothing. So these are pictures of different types of clothing. And this computer has had lots and lots of data in the form of these pictures of clothing where the, where the data has been marked with the name and type of the clothing. Uh, maybe also marked for color or, or, or whether or not it's uh, typically worn by a female or typically worn by a male or, or unisex or whatever. Just, just all these kinds of things can be included in a training algorithm for, for the computer to later be presented with a picture of one that it does not know the answer to and get the answer right just by looking at the picture. So you give the computer lots and lots and lots and lots of examples. Tell it when it gets it right. Tell it when it gets it wrong and how bad it got it wrong. And then let it iterate. This happens over and over and over and over again to the, to the, to the point where you burn lots of power on your computer. And finally, the, the model converges uh, to, an, uh, to, a, to a, a set of parameters that when a model is applied to a picture that's of unknown clothing, it gets close to the right answer almost all the time. This is when you're doing good. Okay, so look. We've got some other target hardware, which I think is of interest. So the AirSpy is on the right and the HackRF1 is on the left. So the AirSpy also comes with a converter that allows you to listen to HF and the HackRF that listens to HF, VHF, UHF and up. So uh, both of these will be software defined radios that I will be using in order to do uh, testing of the trained algorithms. Where will I run the trained algorithm? In the center, is a Jetson Nano two gigabyte uh, processor version. This is a development board, but it's really what we need. Okay, so it has two gigabytes of RAM. So you're not gonna be playing major games on it or running a lot of graphics. You're gonna have it doing number crunching. And it has a fairly high powered GPU on it. And you take your model, you put, tell, tell the program you're gonna run on it to when data comes in, run the model on the data, tell me the answer. So that's what this thing will do. And it has a fairly high-end um, ARM processor with four cores, two gigabytes of RAM, and the cost, and a GPU, and the cost is $59. So I'm gonna start with the least expensive one of these. Uh, it has a you know, fairly high clock rate on both the GPU and the ARM, and we'll see how well it does, and if, this is not enough. The next one up is four gigabytes with uh, six cores and it is uh, $100. And then right above that is another one which has uh, 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 many gigabytes of memory. So they're, they're, they vary, there are several stages. Of them. One of 59, one's 100, one's 300 and one is 700. I don't believe we will need the $700 one. We might need the $400 one, but I don't believe so. I believe the $59 one or the $100 one will allow us to take signals off the air, capture them in a way that the computer can understand, 
tell it to classify the thing we've given it and it will issue an answer. I believe that we can do that. And the reason I believe we can do that is because a student and I have done it before. So a student who's a ham radio operator earned his master's in electrical communication, electrical engineering uh, under me uh, while at Virginia Tech. And we did classifying, identifying types, et cetera, building an SDR from it for a frequency hopping radio for MITRE and the US Army. Now, I'm not gonna tell you the target because I'm not allowed to, but this kind of work informed me of what we can do. And so it did supervised learning, TensorFlow and Keras was used. The entire program learning and application were done in Python calling libraries. This is the work that will be adapted for this problem. And so we will not be taking the frequency hopping radios of interest to MITRE and the Army. We will be taking signals that we get off the air from our own means and train the algorithms to do it that way. But essentially, many of you will have seen a waterfall algorithm. So a waterfall algorithm streams down the page and shows you the spectrum of signals. So if a signal comes on the air, you can detect in the waterfall when something is there, and then you'll grab a block of it and feed it to the computer algorithm that's done the machine learning algorithm, and it will classify the signal to the best of its ability and then pass it off to the next part, which will have a higher grade process running on a software defined radio to doing even better work. So that's kind of the cascaded flow of things that are intended. And the reason I know it works is because we did it on a really hard problem for MITRE and the Army. So we'll gather data from K8ND and KA9Q and others and store locally on a large array that'll be inside this machine. And so all the stuff will be contained in one box that allows us to do lots and lots of training on lots and lots of signals at very high speed. And once we have the classified classification of the signal in terms of type and other parameters that are needed, we can automatically build, say a GNU radio algorithm to process the signals ID'd by deep learning uh, and the, the neural trained deep learning algorithms done by this project. Now, what, is the, what are the promises? The promises is, are this will all be open source, open specification, GPL uh, algorithms will be done in GNU radio and the Python, train, Python training algorithms will be published and how the models are derived will be published and it'll all run on commercial off the shelf hardware that anyone can purchase. So I think this is, we've, and we've finally gotten to this place where the application hardware and the training hardware are, is, is purchasable by individuals and the individual person who just wants to test the algorithms to see how well it does in classifying signals on the air, hopefully giving us feedback so that we can learn to do better, uh, we'll, we'll make this available to all, all, lots and lots of people. Because these, these software defined radios and these, these uh, uh, special purpose ARM based GPU enabled learning computers are getting very inexpensive. It's like this technological revolution is enabling us to do some really neat stuff. So look, uh, uh, I'm a, we'll just want you to know you never underestimate the power of a grandpa with a math degree. And I've done some interesting things with my signal processing. That's me on top of the USS Hampton right before we went under and I stayed under for months. So software defined radio with machine learning enabled tools that allow you to figure out what some signals are and how to process them are really things that are of very great interest. And uh, I'm uh, in Echo Mike 72 IP. My DMR is 3151472. I'm available through a hotspot and that's my email in case you want to contact me. I'm looking for other people who are interested. And with that, we'll stop here and uh, 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 take some questions. Uh, if, if we have time and that's allowed.